Welcome to Keith Knight Don't Tread on Anyone and the Libertarian Institute. This is a summary and excerpt of Churchill, Hitler, and the Unnecessary War chapter regarding the man of the century. Churchill had no more respect for the rights of neutral nations than von Moltke, who said success alone justifies war. Had the German army not first violated Belgian neutrality in 1914, Churchill planned to do so himself with a blockade of Antwerp. As First Lord, he urged the cabinet to seize Dutch and Danish islands, though both nations were neutral. He pressed for a blockade of the Dardanelles when Turkey was still neutral. Churchill's starvation blockade was without modern precedent. To deny food to women and children was a violation of international law and a transgression against human rights. During the Boer War, Lord Salisbury had declared foodstuffs with a hostile destination can be considered contraband of war only if they are supplies for the enemy's forces. It is not sufficient that they are capable of being so used. It must be shown that this was, in fact, their destination at the time of seizure. The starvation blockade of the First Lord Winston Churchill, writes historian Ralph Rago, was probably the most effective weapon employed on either side of the conflict. About 750,000 German civilians succumbed to hunger and disease caused by malnutrition. That is almost a hundred times the number of civilian dead attributed to German atrocities in Belgium. At the bottom here, I cite Martin Gilbert, a historian very favorable to Churchill, provided an estimate of 762,000 deaths uh, as a causal result of First Lord of the Admiralty Winston Churchill's 1914 blockade of uh, Germany. As to the purpose of this hunger blockade, Churchill was direct to starve the whole population, men, women, and children, old and young, wounded and sound, into submission. Very damning quote, uh, Buchanan cites Ralph Rako in Great Wars and Great Leaders of Libertarian Rebuttal. Rako cites Propaganda for War, the Campaign Against American Neutrality, 1914 to 1917 by Horace Cornelius Peterson. Here is the source on the screen, page 83 of the book. Churchill would claim that on the evening of Armistice Day 1918, he had urged Lloyd George to send shiploads of food to Germany in a September 17, 1937 column, answering a charge in the German press that he was an enemy of Germany, Churchill wrote in self-defense, At the moment of Armistice, as is well known, I propose filling a dozen great liners with food and rushing them into Hamburg as a gesture of humanity. As Secretary of State for War in 1919, I pressed upon the Supreme Council the need of lifting the blockade and laid before them the reports from the generals on the Rhine which eventually produced that step. There is, however, no evidence supporting that, that Churchill ever made any sustained effort to end the starvation blockade he imposed as First Lord in August of 1914. While Germany introduced poison gas to the battlefield, Churchill became an enthusiast of its use against enemies of the Empire. When the Iraqis resisted British rule in 1920, Churchill, as Secretary of War and Air, wrote Sir Henry Trenchard, a pioneer of air warfare, I do not understand the squeamishness about the use of gas. I'm strongly in favor of using poison gas against uncivilized tribes to spread a lively terror. Churchill defenders contend he was referring to a non-lethal gas and believed it more humane than high-explosive bombs and shells. But the gas the British used did kill Kurds and Iraqis, and during World War II, Churchill would drop the distinction between non-lethal and deadly gas. The same day he took office as Prime Minister, he ordered the bombing of civilians. After the fall of France, Churchill wrote a somber letter to Lord Beaverbrook, Minister of Air Production. When I look round to see how we can win the war, I see that there is only one sure path. We have no continental army which can defeat German military power. The blockade is broken and Hitler has Asia and probably Africa to draw from. Should he be repulsed here, or not try invasion, he will recoil eastward, and we have nothing to stop him. But there's one thing that will bring him down, and that is an absolutely devastating, exterminating attack by very heavy bombers from this country upon the Nazi homeland. This letter is of great historical significance. 
writes Paul Johnson, marking the point at which the moral relativism of the totalitarian societies invaded the decision-making process of a major legitimate power. Churchill led the West into adopting the methods of barbarism of their totalitarian enemies. By late 1940, writes Johnson, British bombers were being used on a great and increasing scale to kill and frighten the German civilian population in their homes. The policy initiated by Churchill, approved in cabinet, endorsed by parliament, and as far can be judged, enthusiastically backed by the bulk of the British people, thus fulfilling all the conditions of the process of consent in a democracy under law, marked a critical stage in the moral declension of humanity in our times. Another example of how it's not libertarianism, self-ownership, voluntary exchange that leads to moral degeneracy, it's the uh, belief in statism. The adoption of terror bombing was a measure of Britain's desperation, writes Johnson, and, one might add, of the moral decline of Winston Churchill. So far as air strategy was concerned, writes A.J. P. Taylor, the British outdid German frightfulness, first in theory, later in practice, and a nation which claimed to be fighting for a moral cause gloried in the extent of its immoral acts. Man of the Century chapter continues with a subchapter, Wolves with the Minds of Men. In advance to barbarism, to which the Dean of St. Paul's Cathedral wrote the forward, historian F.J.P. Veal traces Britain's abandonment of the rules of civilized warfare to May 11, 1940. Just 24 hours after the German army invaded France, Bomber Command sent 18 Whitley bombers on a night run far from the front on Westphalia. Writes Veal, italicizing his words, This raid on the night of May 11, 1940, although in itself trivial, was an epoch-making event since it was the first deliberate breach of the fundamental rule of civilized warfare that hostilities must only be waged against the enemy combatant forces. It had taken Churchill only 24 hours as Prime Minister to remove the keystone upholding the whole structure of civilized warfare as it had been gradually built up in Europe during the preceding two centuries. From there, that structure of civilized warfare collapsed in ruins. B. H. Liddell Hart confirms it. When Mr. Churchill came into power, one of the first decisions of his government was to extend bombing to the non-combatant area. While the Luftwaffe had bombed cities, Liddell Hart noted the critical strategic and moral difference with what Britain was doing. Bombing of Warsaw and Rotterdam did not take place until German troops were fighting their way into those cities and thus conformed to the old rules of siege bombardment. In his first meeting with Stalin in 1942, Churchill brought up the Royal Air Force bombing of German cities to ingrate himself with the tyrant by impressing upon him how ruthless Britain intended to be. Churchill now spoke of the bombing of Germany. This was already considerable, he said, and would increase. Britain looked upon the morale of the German civilian population as a military target. We sought no mercy, and we would show no mercy. Britain hoped to shatter 20 German cities, as several had already been shattered. If need be, as the war went on, we hope to shatter almost every dwelling in almost every German city. At this point in the conversation, writes Martin Gilbert, the record of the meeting noted, Stalin smiled and said, that would not be bad, and thenceforward, the atmosphere became progressively more cordial. What Churchill had been describing to Stalin was a British policy to de-house the civilian population of Germany, who was the instigator and architect of the policy to carpet bomb German cities, Frederick Lindyman, the prof, an intimate of Churchill's, whom he had brought into his war cabinet as science advisor. Lindemann had almost a pathological hatred for Nazi Germany and an almost medieval desire for revenge. C.P. Snow, a science advisor to the war government, wrote that Lindemann had a zealot's faith in the efficacy of bombing early in 1942, when Britain had failed to achieve a single major victory, Lindemann presented his great paper to the cabinet. The paper laid down a strategic policy. The bombing must be directed especially 
against German working class houses, middle class houses have too much space around them and so are bound to waste bombs, the paper claimed that, given a total concentration of effort on the production and use of bombing aircraft, it would be possible in all the larger towns of Germany, that is, those with more than 50,000 inhabitants, to destroy 50% of all houses. This was to be accomplished in just 18 months, from March 1942 to September 1943. Snow, in his 1960 Godkin lectures at Harvard, asked about himself and his colleagues in wartime, What will people of the future think of us? Will they say, as Roger Williams said of some of the Massachusetts Indians, that they were wolves with the minds of men? Will they think we resigned our humanity? They will have the right. In his 1944 bombing vindicated, J.M. Spate, Principal Secretary for Air Ministry, claims full credit for Churchill's Britain having been first to initiate the bombing of civilians. Because we were doubtful about the psychological effect of propagandist distortion of the truth that it was we who started the strategic bombing offensive, we have shrunk from giving our great decision of May 11, 1940, the publicity which it deserved. It was a splendid decision. It was as heroic, as self-sacrificing as Russia's decision to adopt her policy of scorched earth. Our, quote, splendid, heroic, and self-sacrificing decision to bomb cities, insists Spate, gave Britons the right to stand as equals alongside the Red Army for these preemptive strikes on German cities brought Luftwaffe retaliation on British cities, giving Coventry and Birmingham, Sheffield and Southampton, the right to look to Kiev and Kharkov, Stalingrad and Sebastopol in the face. Our Soviet allies would have been less critical of our inactivity in 1942 if they had understood what we had done. Though British propaganda broadcasts charged that the Luftwaffe had begun the bombing of cities by brutally targeting London. Spate believed that British cities might have been spared had Churchill not first resorted to city bombing. There was no certainty, but there was reasonable probability that our capital and our industry centers would not have been attacked if we had continued to refrain from attacking those of Germany. To achieve the extirpation of Nazi tyranny, there are no lengths of violence to which we will not go, Churchill told Parliament on September 21st, 1943. By 1944, he had come back around to the idea of using chemical and biological warfare on civilians. In one secret project, he commissioned the preparation of 5 million anthrax cakes to be dropped onto the pastures of North Germany to poison the cattle and, through them, the people as the Glasgow Sunday Herald reported in 2001. The aim of Operation Vegetarian was to wipe out the German beef and dairy herds and then see the bacterium spread to the human population. With people then having no access to antibiotics, this would have caused many thousands, perhaps even millions, of German men, women, and children to suffer awful deaths. The anthrax cakes were tested on Gerenard Island off Wester Ross in Scotland, which was not cleared of contamination until 1990. In July of 1944, as the Allies were still attempting a breakout from Normandy, Churchill minuted General Pug Ismay of the Chief of Staff's Committee. I want you to think very seriously over the question of poison gas. We could drench the cities of Ruhr and many other cities in Germany, in such a way that most of the population would be requiring constant medical attention. If we do that, let us do it 100%. In the meantime, I want the matter studied in cold blood by sensible people, and not by that particular set of psalm-singing uninformed defeaters. I shall, of course, have to square Uncle Joe and the President. It is absurd to consider morality on this topic, Churchill told his RAF planners. On the 50th anniversary of the destruction of Dresden, the Washington Post, Ken Ringel, wrote, If any one person can be blamed for the tragedy of Dresden, it appears to have been Winston Churchill. Before leaving for Yalta, Churchill ordered Operation Thunderclap, massive airstrikes to de-house German civilians to turn them into refugees to clog the roads over which German soldiers had to move to stop a Red Army offensive. Air Marshal Arthur 
bomber, Harris, put Dresden on the target list. On the first night of the raid, 770 Lancasters arrived over Dresden around 10 p.m. In two waves, three hours apart, 650,000 incendiary bombs rained down on Dresden's narrow streets and Baroque buildings, together with another 1,474 tons of high explosives, the fires burned for seven days. More than 1,600 acres of the city were devastated compared to 100 acres burning in the German raid on Coventry, and melting streets burned the shoes of those attempting to flee. Cars untouched by the fire burst into flames just from the heat. Thousands sought refuge in cellars where they died, robbed of oxygen by the flames before the buildings above them collapsed. Novelist Kurt Vonnegut, who, as one of the 26,000 Allied prisoners of war in Dresden, helped clean up after the attack, remembers tunneling into the ruins to find the dead sitting upright in what he would describe in Slaughterhouse Five as corpse mines floating in the static water tanks were the boiled bodies of hundreds more. The morning after the Lancaster struck, 500 B-17s arrived over Dresden in two waves with 300 fighter escorts to strafe fleeing survivors. Estimates of the dead in the firestorm range from 35,000 to 250,000. The Associated Press reported Allied war chiefs have made the long-awaited decision to adopt deliberate terror bombing of German population centers as a ruthless expedient to hasten Hitler's doom. In a memo to his air chiefs, Churchill acknowledged what Dresden had been about. It seems to me that the moment has come when the question of bombing German cities simply for the sake of increasing the terror, though under other pretexts, should be reviewed. Sensing they were about to be scapegoated for actions Churchill himself ordered, the air chiefs returned the memo. In his 1947 memoir, Bomber Offensive, Air Marshal Harris implies that Churchill gave the order to incinerate Dresden. I will only say that the attack on Dresden was at the time considered a military necessity by much more important people than myself. Writes A.J.P. Taylor, of his countrymen at war, what mattered was the outlook, the readiness by the British of all people to stop at nothing when waging war. Civilized restraints, all considerations of morality, were abandoned. By the end of the war, men were ready to kill countless women and children. This was the legacy of the bombing strategy which the British adopted with such high-minded motives. Concludes F.J.P. Vale. The indiscriminate bombing of civilians, enemy cities, and civilian property brought about a terrifying and unprecedentedly destructive reversion to primary and total warfare, as once practiced by Sennacherib, Genghis Khan, and Tamerlane. The old Churchill had made young Churchill a prophet, as he had written in his novel, Savarola, long before the war in which he had led his nation. Chivalrous gallantry is not among the peculiar characteristics of excited democracy. Americans, too, played a role in adopting methods of barbarism from which earlier generations would have recoiled in horror and disgust. During World War I, we condemned the British starvation blockade before we went in, but supported it with our warships after we went in. If Churchill initiated terror bombing, America perfected it, boasted Curtis LeMay of his famous raid on Tokyo. We scorched and boiled and baked to death more people in Tokyo that night of March 9th through 10th than went up in vapor in Hiroshima and Nagasaki combined. We and the British fought for moral ends. We did not always use moral means by any Christian definition, and Churchill played the lead role in Western man's reversion to barbarism. It's tempting to say, well, unfortunately, good people have to do bad things to stop even worse people from doing even worse things. Pat Buchanan addresses whether or not this Second World War was even necessary and what would have happened in the absence of Britain's participation. Even had Hitler come west after crushing Stalin's Soviet Union, how could it have been worse than it was for the Jews, or the Gypsies, or the Slavs, or the Christians, tens of millions of whom would die, and 100 million of whom would end up slaves in an empire that was the most brutal and barbaric enemy Christianity had ever known. Had Britain not given the war guarantee and not declared war over Poland, 
Western Europe might have avoided war altogether. And was the war worth it? Let us give the last word to Winston Churchill. Three years after the victory, he wrote in The Gathering Storm, The human tragedy reaches its climax in the fact that after all the exertions and sacrifices of hundreds of millions of people and of the victories of the righteous cause, we have still not found peace or security, and we lie in the grip of even worse perils than those we have surmounted. What did Churchill mean by even worse perils than Nazism and Hitler? He meant Stalinism and Stalin, a mass murderer whose victims exceeded even those of Hitler. By 1948, all of Stalin's promises about elections had been broken, and he was crushing all opposition to communist tyranny in the 11 countries now in his grip, including Czechoslovakia, for which Churchill had wanted to go to war, and Poland, for which Churchill had demanded Britain go to war. If the West faced even worse perils in 1948 than in 1939, what had it all been for? Yes, Hitler was dead and Nazism exterminated, but at a cost of 50 million lives, and Britain had lost 400,000 men and was broken and bankrupt. The next thing that Patrick Buchanan addresses is, what was the war really about? He says, to British statesmen, maintaining a balance of power was dogma. In 1938, Lord Londonderry, back from a meeting with Hitler, wrote to Churchill, I should like to get out of your mind what appears to be strong anti-German obsession. Churchill replied that London to Derry was mistaken in supposing that I have an anti-German obsession and went on to explain. British policy for 400 years has been to oppose the strongest power in Europe by weaving together a combination of other countries strong enough to face the bully. Sometimes it is Spain, sometimes the French monarchy, sometimes the French Empire, sometimes Germany. I have no doubt about who it is now. But if France set up to claim the overlordship of Europe, I should equally endeavor to oppose them. It is thus through the centuries we have kept our liberties and maintained our life and power. Twice this policy would bring Britain into war with Germany until, by 1945, Britain was too weak to play the role any longer. She would lose her empire because of what Lord Salisbury had said in 1877 was the communist error in politics, sticking to the carcass of dead policies. Why did Britain declare war on Germany twice? As we shall see, neither the Kaiser nor Hitler sought to destroy Britain or her empire. Both admired what Britain had built. Both sought an alliance with England. The Kaiser was the eldest grandson of Queen Victoria. Thus, the crucial question. Were these two devastating wars Britain declared on Germany wars of necessity or wars of choice? First, we have the United Kingdom declaration of war upon Germany in 1914. Britain declared war on Germany on the 4th of August, 1914. The declaration was a result of German refusal to remove troops from neutral Belgium. In 1839, the United Kingdom, France, and Prussia, the predecessor of the German Empire, had signed the Treaty of London, which guaranteed Belgium's sovereignty. The United Kingdom declaration of war on Germany 1939 consisted of Neville Chamberlain's speech on September 3rd, in which he said, This morning, the British ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note stating that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock that they were prepared at once to withdraw the troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. So, the war over Polish independence left Poland under the uh, Soviet Empire. Buchanan goes on to say, Yet in his memoir, David Lloyd George, who led Britain to victory in World War I, wrote, We all blundered into war. In his memoirs, Churchill, who led Britain to victory in World War II, wrote, One day, President Roosevelt told me he was asking publicly for suggestions about what the war should be called. I said at once, the unnecessary war. There never was a war more easy to stop than that which has just wrecked what was left of the world from the previous struggle. Buchanan goes on to discuss the Soviet Union after the Second World War. 
While Stalin lost millions of soldiers and civilians and suffered devastation, Stalin emerged from the war as the most powerful czar in history, with the Red Army occupying Berlin, Vienna, and Prague. In the aftermath, communist parties loyal to Stalin would vie for power in Paris and Rome, and communist revolutionaries would help tear down the empires of the West. In 1949, Stalin would treble the subject peoples of communism as China fell to the armies of Mao Zedong, converting America's wartime ally into Stalin's partner in world conquest. In 1949, too, Stalin's scientists with stolen American technology exploded an atomic bomb. For almost all other nations and people of Europe, the war would prove more a disaster than a triumph. Finally, Buchanan discusses Britain after the Second World War. From Norway to France to Greece to Crete to Libya, Britain lost every battle with the Germans until El Alamein in 1942. She would end the war with 400,000 dead and a pirate victory and never again be great. Churchill had devoted his life to three causes, the preservation of the empire, keeping socialism at bay, and preventing any hostile power from dominating Europe. By July of 1945, all three had been lost, and Churchill, dismissed by the people, he had led to victory. I'd like to end with a quote from the Libertarian Party of New Hampshire. There's still people out there calling John McCain a great man and a hero. No! Sorry, Megan McCain. We understand he's your father and all. But that blood-soaked monster didn't see a country on the map he didn't want to invade. Wars don't make great men. Great men prevent wars. Thank you for watching Keith Knight. Don't tread on anyone and the Libertarian Institute.